Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome you also on behalf of the entire Court of Justice of the European Union and of its president to this symposium jointly organized by the Court and the European Society of International Law. This is an important symposium, symposium not only because of the themes to be discussed, but also because of the highly distinguished speakers and the truly international audience present here today. A long time has passed since the well-known EART judgment of 1971 set the grounds for defining the scope of the international competence of the community and that its treaty-making power. Since then, the international status of the community first and the union later has consolidated itself and is not to question it any longer now. However, since then, other problems have arisen as regard that status as well as the role of the court with respect to international law. As far as this role is concerned, it should be stressed that the Court of Justice, as the guarantor, as the guarantor of the rule of law within the European Union, in cooperation with the national courts, is regarded, it is regularly called upon to interpret international law. Most of the Court of Justice case law relating to international legal order therefore concerns the interface between European, national, and international law. One may think, for instance, of a case con concerning measures whose objective is to tackle the financial crisis, to protect the environment, to combat international terrorism, or to channel uh, uh, mass immigration. These cases reflect and itself indeed crystallize the challenge that face the court in even more globalized world. Within this framework, it should be highlighted that rules of international law may not undermine the specific characteristic of the European Union legal order. As stated in opinion 213, on the European Union's accession to the European Convention on Human Rights, I quote, the fact that the EU has a new kind of legal order, the nature of which is peculiar to the European Union, its own constitutional framework and founding principles, a particularly sophisticated institutional structure, and the full set of legal rules to ensure the operation, unquote, as consequences as regard the procedure for the condition and the conditions of accession to international agreements. A balance needs, therefore, to be found between, on the one hand, openness to international law in general, together with diligent compliance with specific international obligations assumed by the European Union, and on the other hand, adequate protection for the integrity and autonomy of the constitutional principles which define the legal identity of the European Union. In the Agamemnon case, decided in 1974, the Court of Justice stated that provision of an international agreement concluded by the European Union are binding upon its institutions and member states and from an integral part of European Union law. Moreover, in Bresciani, the Court held that European Union Association agreements could be invoked in national courts to challenge national law. The Court specified in Kaidi, however, that the autonomy of the European legal union order may not be compromised by the Union's international obligations. The Court therefore held that it enjoys I quote, a jurisdiction to review the validity of the Union measures in the light on the fun of fundamental rights, and annulled the EU measures adopted in order to give effect to the relevant Union United Nations Security Council resolution. <coughs> Those cases illustrate the court balanced approach towards international law. 
Against this background, the topic for today's conference are highly relevant, namely the EU and international dispute settlement to be discussed in session one, and the relationship between European law and the agreements concluded by the member states, which is the subject to, of session two. I wish you all, all an interesting symposium and am confident that our exchange will be extremely fruitful and worthwhile. And now I give the floor to Andre Nelkamper, who is Professor of Public International Law at the University of Amsterdam and the President of the European Society of International Law. And I thank you very much for the attention. Yeah. <laughs> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, also, on my behalf, it's a pleasure to open this event, joint event between the European Society of International Law and the Court of Justice of the European Union. This is the first time the European Society of International Law has organized an event here in Luxembourg. And perhaps I should say it is about time because the issues are of pressing importance. Let me start by saying a few words on the European Society for international law. The European Society was founded about 15 years ago in Florence with the aim to set up a European network of international lawyers, be they government officials, academic practitioners, judges. The need for the European network of international lawyers was premised of the, on the idea that there are shared traditions, shared ambitions, and shared challenges across Europe in the application and development of international law. The need to work together as international lawyers became stronger with the expansion of the membership of the European Union and the increasing global role of the European Union in international affairs. The European society was inspired by the idea that the evolution in European Union law and practice needed to be complemented by a strong network, an increasingly integrated network of international lawyers, whose work would be relevant to the development of the European Union. Since its origin 15 years ago, the European society has grown to be a dynamic and large society. We have now over, one, over 1,300 members in all parts of Europe. We meet once every year for an annual conference, recently in Riga, Estonia, and next year in Naples, Italy. And in between, we meet for smaller events like the current one. These are not just of an academic nature. The European Society makes a point of collaborating with international institutions in practice. We have had two very successful events at the European Court for Human Rights in Strasbourg, and we will have a third event next year in Strasbourg. And we are very happy to have this current event at the premises of the European Court. Obviously, the connection between European Union law and international law is of great interest for the European society, and I would say also for practitioners in the field of European law. And there are many different dimensions to address. In part, these follow from the role of the European Union as a global actor. In part, they relate to the relationship between the European between the Court of Justice and other international courts. And in this context, I can refer to the very recent interesting application by the government of Slovenia against the Republic of Croatia before the European Court of Human Rights last month, which does raise questions of the concurrence between the Court of Justice of the European Union on the one hand and the European Court for Human Rights on the other. And then, of course, there's a string of questions around the application of international law in the European Union and the member states. And it's fair to say that the Court of Justice has played a key role in shaping 
the recep reception of international law inside not only the EU, but also the member states. So this brings us to the topic of today. We have two excellent panels that address various aspects of the application by international, of international law by the court. So let me close by thanking the court in general, President Leinartz, Vice President Tizano, and especially also Judge Rosas for facilitating this event. And I wish you all a very good conference. Thank you very much. begin with the fourth session of our symposium which concerns the EU and international dispute settlement. Before I give the floor to our distinguished speakers, please allow me to make some brief introductory remarks. As you are all aware, in 2014, the European Union concluded the negotiation for two free trade agreements, the proposed Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement with Canada now awaiting final approval, and the trade agreement with Singapore, which is currently the subject of proceedings before the Court of Justice in Opinion 215, a case whose principal object is the, to clarify, just to clarify the extent of European Union competence to conclude this agreement. Moreover, the well-known TTIP is currently under negotiation, although various aspects of that agreement are highly controversial on the either side of the Atlantic. Common to those three trade agreements, or draft trade agreements, is that they contain some form of dispute settlement mechanism. This mechanism takes into account the need to reconcile the goal of protecting and encouraging investment in the European Union with the requirement of a fair and independent system of dispute settlements. The court's case law on the legality of international agreement under European Union law has adopted a prudent approach with regard to dispute settlement mechanism in international agreement to which the European Union is party. On the one hand, in opinion 109, concerning the unified patent litigation system, the court held that an international agreement providing for the creation of a judicial body responsible for the interpretation of its provision is not, in principle, incompatible with European Union law. On the other hand, the court has held in opinion 213 that the setting up of a judicial body by an international agreement that is called upon to interpret and apply not only the provision of that agreement, but also to review the legality of acts of European Union law, would not be compatible with the treaties if that, if that international agreement were thus to, provide, to deprive the courts and the tribunals of the member states of their power to request preliminary ruling from the Court of Justice in the field covered by the agreement. Indeed, jurisdiction to carry out a judicial review of acts, action, or omission on the part of the European Union, including on the basis of fundamental right, cannot be conferred exclusively on an international court outside of the European institu Union institutional and judicial framework. Thus, one, can, one could argue that the legality of international dispute settlement mechanism under European Union law is not undisputed. It is with this word I give now the floor to Peter Kaut, Professor of European Union Law at the University of College of London. Please, Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice President, uh, members of the court, dear colleagues. It's a uh, it's a great honor um, to be able to speak here about um, the European Union and international dispute settlement, and I want to focus my presentation particularly on um, the concept of the uh, autonomy of European Union law from international law and what that concept uh, might mean for international dispute settlement. Um, uh, 
I, I will add that it, it's with some trepidation that I approach this subject, uh, it, among other things, because uh, it's basically focused on the case law of the European Court um, uh, and, and how it has developed that concept in its case law, and because I'm, I will not always be completely uncritical about uh, some of the developments in the case law. So um, the court has articulated this concept and examined its implications, uh, in a, particularly in a series of opinions to which reference has already been made, uh, opinions on envisaged international agreements. And uh, I will try to briefly deconstruct the concept of autonomy from international law and to try to examine what it means for the EU's participation in international dispute settlement. Now, I start very early on because I think the judicial effort to disconnect EU law from its international law origins and foundations goes back as far as Van Gent and Loos, where the Court of Justice emphasized that EU law constituted a new legal order of international law. And as we all know, the court very soon uh, in following judgments uh, omitted the of international law qualifier, simply referring to a, a new legal order. So the autonomous nature of, of EU law is, very, is part of its very identity. Now, I think that the meaning of the autonomy of EU law is relatively clear insofar as it concerns the relationship between uh, European Union law and the domestic laws of the member states. Their uh, autonomy is primarily a hermeneutic tool aimed at ensuring that EU law concepts are interpreted in a way that marks a sufficient degree of independence from domestic law concepts. For example, the term workers in Article 45, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, is an autonomous concept of EU law, and its scope is not dependent on the definition of an employed person under domestic law. And of course, it could not be otherwise, uh, for else the basic goals which the European Union uh, pursues, such as free movement of workers, would uh, really disintegrate in the face of their dependency on uh, variable and varying concepts of domestic law. So this hermeneutic tool of autonomy is required for the very effectiveness of EU law uh, and is also, I think, intimately linked to primacy and direct effect. But I would note that it's also, uh, in relation to domestic law, a, a relative autonomy in various ways. There are many examples of non-autonomous EU law concepts, particularly in EU legislation, which fre frequently defines concepts with reference to domestic law. And of course, autonomy is also limited by the imperative of integrating EU law into domestic law. And any student, I don't need to say that here in this room, but any student of EU law is aware that in many fields, there are no obvious boundaries between EU law and domestic law. And I think the country where I teach uh, is also uh, gradually experiencing that. Uh, the main harmonization instrument, the directive e exemplifies this intended integration of EU law with domestic law. By contrast, I would say that the autonomy of EU law from international law is a slightly more nebulous and contested concept. Um, if the Court of Justice affirmed the autonomy of EU law early on, including in terms of EU law constituting a new legal order that's generally distinct from international law, uh, it left that particular form of autonomy undefined for several decades. Indeed, the Court's initial rulings, and again reference has been made to them already, uh, arguably embraced international law by establishing that international agreements concluded by the European Union are an integral part of EU law. Of course, this embrace was qualified by the need to establish the direct effect of such agreements as a precondition for their judicial enforcement in certain cases. But nevertheless, the basic principle that international norms that are binding on the European Union are an integral part of European Union law is not one that affirms the autonomy of EU law from international law. Now, opinion one of 91 on the EEA agreement was the first ruling in which the court referred to the uh, autonomy concept in connection with international law and international agreement. Uh, as you know, the court considered that the proposed jurisdiction of the EEA court, which was originally envisaged, 
uh, uh, the jurisdiction of a court which would have included ruling on the division of competences between the uh, then EEC and its member states was, and I quote, likely uh, adversely to affect the allocation of responsibilities defined in the treaties and hence the autonomy of the community legal order. But I don't think it can be said that that opinion to which I will return uh, introduced a general autonomy from international law, nor was it perceived as such at the time. The EEA agreement is a very special agreement because it aims to extend the EU inter internal market to other European countries um, uh, as homogeneously as possible. In further opinions and in uh, the Cardi 1 judgment, the court repeated these findings about the autonomy of EU law, uh, each time in connection with the risk that an international agreement may affect this allocation of responsibilities among the EU institutions. Um, and it's really only in opinion 2 of 13 on the uh, accession to the European Convention that the court in fact stated in general terms that EU law enjoys autonomy, and again I quote, in relation to the laws of the member states and in relation to international law, end of quotation. And as we know, that opinion identified a number of shortcomings of the draft accession agreement that had been negotiated, uh, most of which had to do with the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights over EU institutions uh, or matters of EU law. Now, this kind of understanding of the autonomy of EU law from international law is obviously crucial for the EU's participation in international dispute settlement. So, let me examine it a little bit further. Um, the, uh, and I'm particularly going to look at the uh, opinions of the court, which have been already referred to, but just perhaps explore them a little bit more in depth, uh, because the, the instrument of the opinion has enabled the court not just to rule on questions of EU external competence, but also, uh, in fact, as far back as opinion 176, to rule on, uh, uh, on the autonomy of, of EU law and systems of dispute settlement. Opinion 176 is perhaps worth recalling very long time ago, but um, it uh, in a nutshell already had some of the issues there. The focus there was the institutional setup of the so-called European Laying Up Fund, uh, in particular as regards dispute settlement in connection with the courts, uh, Court of Justice's own, own jurisdiction. The court rejected the envisaged uh, com composition of the fund tribunal, tribunal which was going to be set up under that agreement, which was going to have six judges of the EU Court of Justice and one Swiss judge. Um, the tribunal would have had jurisdiction to interpret the agreement in issue, and there was a risk of conflicts, the court said, conflicts of jurisdiction with the court that would also have had such jurisdiction. For Court of Justice judges to sit on both judicial organs would have interfered with their impartiality because of the uh, potential overlap between the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice and this fund tribunal. That opinion was the starting point for a series of rulings in which the court has imposed further and I would argue ever more stringent conditions on the EU's participation in international dispute settlement. Um, to some degree, perhaps this process has been uh, assisted also by the EU's political institutions, which have on the whole responded by respecting the conditions which the court has imposed, which is not necessarily a, a, a condition of the treaties, because the treaties can be amended in response to an opinion, but that has not happened. So by accom accommodating the court's concerns, and I would argue that perhaps the process of uh, imposing these uh, ever more stringent conditions has also been assisted, assisted by the court's approach to precedent. The practice of building on previous judicial statements, which are perhaps from time to, to time, and I try to express myself as uh, politely as I can, uh, uh, perhaps too often seen as dogma rather than a case-specific finding, which needs to be confirmed in a new case before being extended. And sometimes these statements, I think, are taken as building blocks, and this allows the court to impose more conditions. Now, I've already mentioned Opinion 1 of 91 on the original EEA agreement, 
which included an EEA court, and in that sense was comparable to the 176 uh, opinion, uh, an EEA court designed to settle disputes between the contracting parties and to ensure the homogeneity of e EEA law with EU internal market law. Court of Justice made two basic findings in that opinion. First, it emphasized the differences between the EEA agreement and the European Union treaties in terms of their objectives, economic on the one hand versus deeply political on the other hand, and in terms of their context, EU law as a new legal order versus uh, an, an agreement under international law. It concluded that complete homogeneity was unattainable and it found that the EEA court would threaten the autonomy of e EU law because it would need to deal with questions concerning the division of competences between the EU and its member states. This would adversely affect this allocation of responsibilities defined in the treaties to which I've already referred, and in particular also the court's own uh, exclusive jurisdiction. Um, furthermore, the EEA court would interpret, and I quote, a large body of legal rules which is juxtaposed to a corpus of identically worded community rules. And this, the court said, conditioned the future interpretation of the community rules on free movement and competition. At the time, commentators were of the opinion that the court uh, perhaps somewhat exaggerated the differences between the e e EU treaties and the EEA agreement. Uh, be that as it may, I think that this opinion can still be seen, uh, or the objections which the court had, as being concerned with the kind of hermeneutic autonomy of EU law that is characteristic also of its relationship with national law. The EEA agreement was unique in its attempt to extend EU internal market and competition law as homogeneously as possible, and a parallel EEA court with jurisdiction to interpret such an identical set of rules with an international law framework, which was arguably different from community law, could indeed have interfered with uh, community law's hermeneutic autonomy at a deep level. One should, in this respect, not lose sight of, of course, the political debate about the nature of the EU at the time, whether it's a free trade zone, an integrated market, or a political union. And the United Kingdom is still struggling with uh, how to conceive of the European Union, I think. So hermeneutic autonomy uh, is, of course, institutionally embodied in the Court of Justice's jurisdiction, which is indeed, in some respects, exclusive. But I think the terms, in some respects, in relation to that exclusiv exclusivity, need to be emphasized, uh, as, of course, the courts and tribunals of the member states are also instructed to interpret and apply EU law. Um, the response to Opinion 191 was to renegotiate the judicial side of the EEA agreement. The EEA court was replaced with the EFTA court, whose jurisdiction is limited to the non-EU contracting parties, and the Court of Justice approved of this renegotiation. Um, and some years later, the EEA set up and the uh, opinions of the court on the EEA agreement guided the EU in how it constructed the European uh, Common Aviation Area. Um, and in the further opinion on that case, the court accepted the, uh, the setup uh, and its detailed reasoning does not need to be analyzed here. But I think the opinion shows a little bit of this building block approach that I described earlier. The court uh, recalled at the outset in two short paragraphs that, first of all, preservation of the autonomy of the community legal order requires first that the essential character of the powers of the community and its institutions as conceived in the treaty remain unaltered and secondly that the procedures for ensuring uniform interpretations of the rules of the ECAA agreement and for resolving disputes will not have the effect of binding the community and its institutions in the exercise of their powers to a particular interpretation of the rules of community law referred to in that agreement. Two short paragraphs which uh, I think put in such general terms uh, and outside the context of an agreement like the EEA agreement, um, one could say the, the autonomy concept is widened there and less focused on ensuring hermeneutic autonomy.
Um, I was going to say a number of words on uh, opinion 109 as well, but in view of the time, I may skip that and turn to uh, the more recent opinion uh, 213 on accession to the European uh, Convention, which uh, speaks uh, in terms about the autonomy of EU law from international law. And of course, the, the opinion does so quite extensively, and we do not have time for a full analysis of uh, the statements made by the court there, but allow me to highlight just some of the statements to perhaps try to show how the concept uh, of autonomy has evolved over time. The Court of Justice is concerned in that opinion that the European Court of Human Rights would, in the context of decision-making on the joint responsibility of the European Union and its member states, be, and I quote, required to assess the rules of EU law governing the division of powers between the EU and its member states. The court further objects that the so-called prior involvement procedure, enabling uh, it to rule on a point of EU law before the European Court of Human Rights review of compliance with the Convention, that this, that this prior involvement procedure interferes with the court's task as the ultimate interpreter of EU law. That is so because the accession agreement would allow the Court of Human Rights to rule on whether the Court of Justice has already determined a point of EU law or has not yet done so. And this, the Court of Justice considers, would be tantamount to conferring on the European Court of Human Rights jurisdiction to interpret the case law of the Court of Justice. Uh, moreover, the procedure would not allow questions of interpretation uh, of EU law to be referred to the court only, only questions of uh, validity. This the Court of Justice cannot accept, and again I quote, if the Court of Justice were not allowed to provide the definitive interpretation of secondary law, and if the European Court of Human Rights, in considering whether that law is consistent with the Convention, had itself to provide a particular interpretation from among the plausible uh, options, there would most certainly be a breach of the principle that the court has exclusive jurisdiction over the definitive interpretation of EU law. Um, there's a couple of other references to autonomy in the opinion, but I skipped them. Um, but it does seem to me that what, what appears to be at stake uh, in this opinion is the Court of Justice's own authority, in the sense of having the final word, particularly what, would be, what could be called what could be termed structural issues of fundamental rights protection. I mean, here I refer to the concerns over the interplay between Article 53 of the Convention uh, and Article 53 of the Charter, uh, the uh, Maloney case law, the concerns over the principle of mutual trust, and the concerns over the potential effects of Protocol 16 to the Convention, allowing national courts, highest courts, to make reference to the uh, uh, Court of Human Rights. So what to make of all these uh, autonomy-related concerns? I think Opinion 213 further extends the autonomy of EU law from international law in two interconnected ways. First, hermeneutic autonomy is expanded to such an extent that I think it may endanger uh, or make more difficult the EU's participation in international dispute settlement. And secondly, autonomy acquires a much stronger institutional dimension in the sense of protecting the adjudicative model of EU law. That's particularly also clear in Opinion uh, 109 on the, uh, on the Patent Court. Uh, and in particular, the Court of Justice's ability to have the final word. If I may, I would like to offer a, co a couple of comments on the first extension, the extension um, in such a way that it makes uh, EU participation in international dispute settlement more difficult. Um, the fear that, in my view, that accession to the Convention would enable the European Court of Human Rights to interpret EU law and decide points of EU law in such a way that it would interfere with the hermeneutic autonomy of EU law um, may be somewhat excessive and unwarranted. Um, insofar as that fear relates to the provisions of the EU Charter, which replicate the Convention, uh, the position is of course very different from the replication of EU internal market and competition law in the EEA agreement, because the Convention has itself been a source for EU human rights protection from the early days that the European Court of Justice has developed its case law on fundamental rights. 
So instead of the, the model of the EU treaties being extended uh, to an international agreement, here we have an international agreement, the convention, which has inspired, and rightly so, of course, the, the case law of the court and has, led, uh, has been incorporated in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. The Charter very clearly confirms uh, that this is a source of EU uh, fundamental rights uh, in its uh, preamble and in the explanations which clarify that the uh, Charter should also be uh, interpreted in line with the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, whether the EU accedes to the Convention or not, the European Convention has, uh, the European Court of Human Rights, of course, has authority to interpret the Convention, uh, and its interpretations will, to some degree, need to guide the Court of Justice in, in the interpretation of the corresponding Charter provisions. Um, the, the, so the, the European Court of Human Rights case law has effects on the interpretation of the Charter, which can never be wholly autonomous. Um, the preamble of the Charter, in fact, confirms that it reaffirms the rights as they result, in particular from the constitutional traditions and international obligations common to the Member States, the Treaty on European Union, the Community Treaties, the European Convention, the Social Charters adopted by the Community and by the Council of Europe, and the case law of the Court of Justice and of the European Court of Human Rights. Now, to be fair to the Court of Justice, Opinion 213 does not expressly object to this relationship between the European Convention and the Charter, and to the Court of Human Rights' general interpretative authority, but it does, however, in the opinion, uh, nonetheless allude to potential interference uh, post-accession with how the Court might like to interpret the Charter. So in the context of the Convention and accession to it and the EU system of fundamental rights protection, it seems to me to be one of the very premises of EU fundamental rights protection that the European Convention uh, and the European Court of Human Rights case law may affect EU law. In that sense, the accession to the Convention is the mirror image of the extension of the EU internal market and competition law to the EEA. But what to make of the specific objections which the Court of Justice voices as regards the way in which accession would have enabled the Court of Human Rights to rule on the division of competences on whether the, and on whether the Court of Justice has determined a point of EU law and on what the right interpretation may be. As I've tried to show elsewhere, um, I think that the concern that the European Court of Human Rights would be deciding questions of the division of competences between the EU and the Member States, when it is deciding questions of joint responsibility, um, is based on a, a, a conflation of, uh, on the one hand, the international law rules of international responsibility, and the EU uh, principles on uh, the division of competences, which is perhaps not as justified as the court may, may have considered at the time. Because it does seem to me that under international law, whether the EU or a member state would be responsible under the convention after accession uh, by the EU, is primarily a factual matter of attribution of conduct, not a normative matter of uh, allocation of competence. The relevant international law rules and principles focus on acts or omissions and que questions of legal competence uh, could at most be tangentially relevant there, I think. And even if the European Court of Human Rights were to consider matters of EU and member state competence, its findings in this regard, of course, could not bind the EU Court of Justice uh, because the jurisdiction of the Court of Human Rights is, in Strasbourg is confined to interpreting the Convention. It has no jurisdiction to authoritatively determine what uh, European Union law, how that should be read. Um, I think my view would be similar on the concerns over uh, the fact that the European Court of Human uh, Rights might uh, be looking at how to interpret uh, EU law, might be looking at the case law of the EU Court of Justice to see whether uh, a provision or rule of EU law has been interpreted. Again, international law doctrine uh, looks at uh, these questions of domestic law or municipal law as questions of fact. That's, of course, a very convenient uh, legal fiction which barely masks the fact that an interpretative effort is taking place. Um, but it's, it's, on the other hand, uh, almost impossible for an international court or tribunal to actually uh, 
uh, perform its function, which is to review whether the contracting parties have complied with their obligations under the relevant agreement, if that international court or tribunal cannot itself look at uh, how the law of that contracting party uh, is framed and what it actually means. Um, and we see that even to some degree here uh, at, at the Court of Justice when cases are brought against the member states that uh, uh, the Commission has to prove what the law of a member state is and that the Court of Justice will decide uh, how to read that domestic law to find whether there is a violation of the treaties. The same happens, uh, a corresponding uh, exercise happens at the level of the WTO, uh, where the EU is a party and where WTO panels and the uh, appellate body uh, may need to <coughs> interpret EU law in cases where the EU's compliance is in issue. And even the European Court of Human Rights, of course, has already interpreted uh, EU law in a very significant way, particularly in its Bosphorus opinion, where it has analysed the equivalence between the system of human rights protection in the European Union and that of the Convention. Um, so it's not uh, as if the Court uh, has not uh, looked at EU law as yet. So I, I have some, uh, some doubts about uh, whether these concerns which the court had together with a series of others uh, are as justified as they may seem at, at first stage. At any rate, uh, I think uh, we should be careful uh, whether we want to extend uh, these principles in the way in which they were developed in Opinion 213 to other cases of the European Union uh, getting involved in international dispute settlement. Given, the, given particularly the prevalent, uh, still today, may change uh, over time, but the prevalent practice of concluding mixed agreements, I think that litigation under such agreements will always risk throwing up questions of uh, division of international responsibility between the EU and its member states. Um, think, for example, of future investor protection agreements uh, or of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, um, or the European Convention after accession. The only way in which that could be avoided would be by uh, the EU assuming responsibility in all cases, and I think uh, as a matter of, of practice uh, that's not really uh, on the cards, particularly for wide international agreements. Um, so I think if indeed international courts and tribunals were to consider the division of competences in matters of international responsibility, which I, I don't think is necessarily always the case, the dangers of, uh, to the autonomy of EU law would, in my view, be more limited than Opinion 213 appears to assume. It would simply not be uh, within the jurisdiction of an international court to determine as a matter of EU law what the internal division of competences is. Um, and again, similar concerns could be, or sim similar observations could be made in relation to uh, international courts uh, uh, looking at other points of EU law. Uh, as a last point, I think the, the opinions in which the court has stressed the autonomy of EU law are each concerned with particular cases where there is a great deal of overlap or shared ancestry between the international convention, treaty or agreement in issue on the one hand and the EU treaties and EU law on the other hand. They are quite specific cases on specific agreements which raise concerns which are uh, specific to them. I think that the statements and findings of those opinions ought not necessarily to be extended uh, to different, more arm's length agreements without a proper inquiry into the relevant differences. Um, and of course the EU treaties do instruct the European Union to be a global actor, Andre has already referred to that, but not only a global actor, also one that takes multilateral cooperation and treaty making seriously. It's confirmed in Article 3, Paragraph 5 and Article 21 on the Treaty on European Union. And I think that requires uh, a certain degree of openness and perhaps in some cases uh, a more restricted uh, idea of what the autonomy of EU law from international law means. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Eckhout, also for the, this interesting development about uh, the idea of uh, autonomy, about which I believe we discuss later on. And uh, now I give the floor to my distinguished colleague, Professor Alan Rosas, judge 
court of justice of European Union. Well, thank you so much. Uh, someone who <coughs> supported and perhaps even participated a little bit in the setting up of, of the European Society of International Law quite some time ago. It's, of course, a, a big pleasure of seeing the, the society and, and many of its distinguished members uh, visiting our court today. I, 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 I thank Andre and the, and the society also for this initiative. <coughs> um, let me remind you and myself of a certain personal experience, and I'll, I'll start by that. Um, between the years of 1995 and 2002, I was almost dealing with these issues of international dispute settlement on a daily basis uh, as, as head of the, of the external relations department in the, in the commission legal service. And, and based on that experience, I, I also did a, a comprehensive article for the German Yearbook of International Law, which was published in 2003. So now we are 2016, and, and, and it was with a certain amount of interest and perhaps also concern that I started to look into what has happened after 2003, because here at the court, we don't always have the time to, to follow events which are not directly present in, in actual cases before us. And, and I must say, I, I, was, I was surprised um, uh, by the fact that so much had happened in the meantime. I, I, I certainly could maybe foresee that something had happened, but, but that there were so many developments in concerning the subject of EU and international dispute settlements. And as I <clears throat> knew from beforehand what Piet would, would speak about, in other words, the opinions uh, which deal with this concept of autonomy and so on, uh, <clears throat> and also because on that very question, I unfortunately have to be a little bit prudent uh, for reasons that you can, you can well understand uh, if um, uh, to the extent that, that we may in the, in the future, even possibly near future, have, 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 have new cases concerning, uh, let's say, investor-to-state dispute settlement procedures in this or that agreement or so on. So <clears throat> I thought of, of, of bringing uh, in a little bit and sharing with you a, a little bit the more general uh, view on or, or, or information on what is happening in actual uh, practice. Um, in the 1990s, uh, the EU was rather cautious when it came to accepting what, what we often called third-party dispute settlement, in other words, international courts or arbitration tribunals or, or, or the like. But uh, from the mid-1990s, already things started to change. And uh, <clears throat> you could really say that the World Trade Organization was a sort of a game changer. 1994 is the crucial year. There, of course, the Union not only uh, accepted but actively supported the creation of a compulsory binding um, dispute settlement um, system, which consists of, in the first instance, of, of panels called ex expert groups in, in French but then above all of the appellate body as a more or less permanent international court. Uh, more or less at the same time, the Union also accepted the Energy Charter Treaty, which uh, already then uh, provided for investor-to-state dispute settlement. And in 1998, the European community, as it was called at that time, um, concluded the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which also has a system of compulsory binding uh, dispute settlement. Uh, you don't necessarily have to accept the jurisdiction of the Hamburg Tribunal, and, and the Union did not do that, but if you don't accept the Hamburg Tribunal, then uh, you accept compulsory arbitration. In the first case, where the Union was uh, 
involved and I happen to be the agent of the union, in that case, a swordfish case, uh, the European, uh, Chile versus the European Union, the, the two parties agreed also to save money to use the Hamburg Tribunal. Um, so there was a special chamber. There was never a judgment because at some point the, that dispute was settled through political negotiations with Chile. Uh, but it certainly could have led to a, a judgment. Now, if we, if we look at what has happened uh, subsequently, uh, much more indeed has uh, happened. Um, and what was particularly striking when I tried to look what has happened in the in this uh, century um, was um, the EU practice when it comes to international trade and cooperation agreements with third countries. So in these agreements, which um, are usually more developed than the old trade and cooperation agreements with the Balkans, with Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, with the Mediterranean countries, with many Latin American countries or different parts of Latin America, and, and with different sub-regions of the ACP states, African, Caribbean, and, and Pacific states, also with Korea, obviously, uh, the Republic of, of Korea, all these agreements have, I would say, surprisingly detailed rules on compulsory and binding arbitration. But uh, we have to remember, in these agreements, it's state-to-state -state arbitration. Um, so it's Chile or Mexico and so on, and the European Union that can be parties to these disputes. In some cases, it might also be involving uh, the EU member states, or at least some of them, because uh, practically all these agreements are so-called uh, mixed agreements. Uh, there are some differences. Uh, time doesn't allow to go into, into all these differences between them, but there is also a, a general pattern that we can, that we can see. Normally, it's uh, three arbiters, one plus one plus one. The two parties can appoint uh, each one, and then there's a neutral chairman. Uh, it is not possible to block uh, the appointments because there, there has to be, normally, there has to be lists drawn up on beforehand, consisting very often of five plus five plus five persons. And then if the parties cannot agree, uh, someone is requested, it might be the chairman of a joint committee that the parties have set up, to draw by lot the three arbiters that will be selected. Uh, probably partly because of the opinions that Piet Eckhout was referring to, uh, uh, these agreements normally specify that the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal is limited to interpreting the agreement itself. And in some of these agreements, there is even a clause saying that they are not allowed to interpret national law. Um, and in, in very few agreements, uh, which uh, may provide for a certain amount of harmonization, approximation of laws. There is even the possibility, for instance, the Ukraine agreement, to submit that if there's a harmonization. In other words, it's the same rules practically in the agreement as in EU law, then to submit the disputes to this court, uh, not to arbitration. So. I have no idea whether this is so, but I would assume that these kind of provisions have been inserted in order to take into account um, the case law of this court expressed in these different opinions that, that Piet was uh, referring to. Uh, just to mention very briefly another example, 
of, um, of an agreement which is not really a trade agreement, at least in the, in the strict sense of the word, the air transport agreement between the European Union, its member states on the one hand, and the United States on the other, also has a binding arbitration clause. And very recently we could read in, in the newspapers that the Commission has uh, decided to start an arbitration against the United States on the basis of that agreement, and very concretely it concerns uh, Norwegian air and if you ask how is this possible, it's a Norwegian company which is not the EU member, it's Norwegian Air Ireland, which is involved and, and, and denial of access to the US market. And, um, and so what I have understood from these newspaper articles, uh, a formal uh, commission uh, decision, which probably will be published, is to be expected rather sooner than than later. Uh, now then, uh, finally, there are, of course, uh, also the new generation of, of, or even one more new generation of trade and cooperation agreements. Uh, and, and some examples have already been mentioned before, uh, Canada and Singapore, but also negotiations are going on with, um, or I think practically concluded with Vietnam, but going on, on with India, Japan, etc. And um, what is remarkable in, in these quite recent agreements, and some of them only being drafts, is that in addition to this state-to-state -state arbitration that you will find in, in all these earlier agreements, uh, there is also a separate system, but only concerning the investment chapter of that agreement, which involves investor-to-state uh, dispute settlement. In other words, a private investor may, may take a case against um, uh, Canada if it's a European investor or vice versa if it's a Canadian investor. This model, of course, is based on the bilateral investment treaties that practically all our member states have concluded uh, I think uh, somewhere I've seen the, 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 the number of 1,300 such in bilateral investment agreements concluded by the member states with, uh, with around 150 third countries. Well, <clears throat> all of them are not necessarily in function anymore, and some of them are in the process even of being replaced, because the idea with these new EU agreements uh, is indeed to replace uh, the investment agreements that member states have concluded with that particular state, for instance, with Canada. Of course, uh, with TTIP, uh, that is also um, uh, uh, the, the something which is envisaged, even if the f fate of TTIP obviously is, 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 is more uncertain. Uh, both concerning TTIP and, and Canada, what is even more remarkable is that not only uh, as the Commission proposed and when it comes to Canada, the other party accepted uh, investor-to-state uh, dispute settlement in, 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 in normal arbitration, but what is also foreseen is a more or less permanent uh, investment court and also an appellate court. The, the court of first instance, first instance being composed of 15 members but then normally it would sit in chambers of three based on, on rotation by uh, random. Uh, <clears throat> as um, our vice president said, uh, we have a pending case, uh, opinion 215, uh, which is um, a requested opinion on uh, the competence questions concerning the Singapore agreement. And it, it, it may be worth its while to, to repeat what he said, that it only concerns the competence question. It does not concern the question of compatibility. Uh, but obviously, one cannot exclude that, that uh, such a question comes before this court um, at some stage later on, not necessarily concerning Singapore, but, but maybe maybe in some other context that remains to be uh, 
seen. Uh, anyway, uh, as I said, a lot have happened at the international scene. Then there are, of course, all these internal questions and problems, but now I, I'm looking at my watch, so I, maybe I just mention very briefly that, that when it comes to the representation of the European Union in these dispute settlement bodies, it, it seems to be more or less now a key, as we would say, that this is something for the Commission. And uh, there is also obviously a, a judgment of our court, Council versus Commission, which concer concerns a, a brief that the Commission um, presented to the Hamburg Tribunal, uh, and where uh, the court also accepted that, that this was something for the Commission. There is also a lot of, I can't go into details, but there's a lot of secondary law uh, or decisions of the Council or, 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 or similar, which uh, more or less uh, are based on a similar approach, even in relation to some mixed agreements. In other words, it has been accepted, at least in some context, that is the Commission that can somehow represent both the Union and its member states. Uh, <clears throat> mixity obviously uh, may entail a lot of other problems concerning international dispute settlements and responsibility and so on. Uh, I'll be happy, happy to say something if there are questions on that regard, but, but, but for the moment uh, I'll, <clears throat> I'll stop here and then just note that in addition to all these problems, there are, of course, the, the intra, the internal EU uh, question of investment, bilateral investment agreements still applicable between the member states. And, and here again, the Court of Justice has been consulted because we have a request for a preliminary ruling from the German Supreme Court, uh, the so-called ACMEA case, um, where the German uh, Supreme Court uh, uh, asks question about the legality, continued legality, of, of this type of, of investor-to-state intra-EU arbitration procedures in view of Article 267 of the EU Treaty, but also in view of Article 344, which says that our court should, should have, have a monopoly on, on questions of, of EU law. And there is another case before the General Court, the Mikula case, uh, which um, um, uh, concerns a decision of the Commission to uh, rule that uh, complying with an arbitral award to pay compensation would be illegal state aid. Uh, and this question is still pending before the General Court, but of course one cannot exclude that that as well comes uh, to the ECJ. Uh, I should really stop here so that we should have some, some time for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Now we have about a little bit more than 20 minutes to have a discussion about the two relations we have heard still now. I ask if somebody would intervene. on both is a badly and then and you give you 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 say your name before us intervene please thank you um, my name is Kieran Bradley I used to be a judge in the civil service court before it was abolished um, my question is to uh, indeed both speakers or indeed anyone else who has experience on it we have some eminent um, lawyers from the commission here how well do these um, dispute settlement procedures work? Have there been major problems and could they be extended to other areas than simply trade? And I have in mind in particular an agreement which will come up in a couple of years called Brexit. Uh, will the British be uh, as, as willing to accept the possibility of a reference to the European Court of Justice as the Ukrainians, to my surprise, uh, are? Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, I forgot to, to say that, that even if there has been a lot of, 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 of things going on when it comes to treaty practice of the European Union or clauses to include, in these bilateral trade and cooperation agreements that I refer to with different parts of the world, uh, there has not been a single case so far. 
uh, that doesn't mean that there, there will not be. Uh, and uh, what I have also understand from also from some public references is that there have been a few instances when this has been considered, but um, uh, finally there has been a political settlement and that's why the actual uh, formal procedure has not been, been invoked. Um, I already mentioned myself an example of a non-trade agreement by also a binding dispute settlement, in other words, the aviation agreement with the United States, but there are many other examples. So, so that's, of course, possible. Uh, but then when it comes to accepting the, the jurisdiction of the, of the European Court of Justice, well, that, that's, of course, a, a, another matter. Um, there were four points which were cons consistently mentioned in the Brexit debate in the United Kingdom, and one of them was that we cannot accept uh, these foreign judges, um, as it was said, who have never been to the United Kingdom. Um, so maybe that answers your question on that point. Thank you. Arman Sarvarian, University of Surrey. I'd like to pose a question, please, concerning a point that was mentioned in the presentations of both Professor Hikot and Judge Rosas, uh, namely on the law of international responsibility, and specifically the contradistinction between, on the one hand, the attribution of conduct, a factual exercise, as was mentioned, perhaps as a uh, the stereotypical international lawyer's understanding of the problem, and on the other hand, the question of normative competence, perhaps the stereotypical European Union lawyer's understanding of the problem. Uh, in the swordfish arbitration here, the, the conduct was essentially concerning the conduct of Spanish fishermen, uh, a matter that, due to the intervention of what became the European Union, was then understood as a problem on the exclusive competence of fisheries. Uh, and here, the status of the articles on state responsibility and their counterpart for international organizations is potentially pertinent. And specifically on this as well, the position of the European Commission in the development of the latter set of articles, uh, which took the position essentially that the whole thing insofar as the European Union is concerned is a matter of the construction of the treaties. Uh, and so any other party in a third uh, dispute settlement process must essentially understand what, must essentially accept whatever is the Commission's understanding of the, the uh, position under the treaties. This is, of course, not only a problem uh, or a contrast in the Court of Justice, but also uh, elsewhere at the European Court of Human Rights, for example, looking at the Al Jeddah and other cases there. So I wonder if you could elaborate on this particular problem. Uh, in terms of the different understandings of the problem. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would not go so far as to say that the, the articles on international uh, responsibility of international organ organizations uh, completely embody the, the principle that one should look at the division of competence. It was certainly part of the debate and there are provisions in the articles which do seem to make reference to, to that idea, but there are others as well and the basic principles remain that you should look at acts, um, acts or omissions. Um, I mean, it's, um, it, it generally seems to me that there is a, a kind of um, incentive for the European Union as an international actor to, of course, promote its identity and its activity on the international scene and to translate that into a, a desire almost to assume international responsibility, even if the responsibility may actually be located more in a member state than in the actions of the European Union institutions. And that's perhaps un understandable. I, I wonder from time to time whether that's uh, always a wise course of action to take. I mean, even if you look at areas of exclusive competence, such as fisheries or uh, trade or uh, investment protection for the large part uh, under the new provisions of uh, Article 207, um, if you look particularly at, for example, investor protection, there seems to me to be a difference between the European Union having exclusive competence to uh, conclude international agreements in this field, to legislate in this particular field, to commit the European Union to a particular level of investor protection, 
and on the other hand, the, the questions of responsibility as to, which may be really mostly, particularly with investor protection, an issue of what a member state has been doing uh, nationally rather than, than, than any European Union legislation or, or, or action. Um, and, and I fear somewhat that, that, that the day may come that the EU uh, kind of regrets that it's been insisting on assuming responsibility uh, in cases where it may prove quite difficult to also force the member states to actually comply with the, with the international commitment where the union may assume responsibility and, and may not have all the tools to ensure that, that the member state complies. So uh, that, that there is certainly uh, a difference in my view between these questions of who has acted and, and violated the commitments and the questions of, of, uh, of competence. Thank you. <clears throat> Maybe just one word on this. Uh, f first of all, maybe if you allow, Piet, uh, I, I'm not sure I would agree 100% with what you said in your introductory remarks on competence and responsibility. I think it's, it's very difficult to, to distinguish them, in fact. Uh, they, they are sort of somehow the, the, the other side of the same coin. Um, but uh, in practice, at least, uh, that also has to do with whether there's a declaration of competence or not. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's no declaration of competence, many authors, probably most who have written books on this question, say that the union is responsible for the whole in relation to, to third parties. Uh, <clears throat> in the WTO context that has also been practiced so that even when the United States sometimes have started cases against Greek, Greece or Denmark, the European Commission just has walked, walked, walked in, in, the, in the consultations and more or less taken over. And, and that has been sometimes grudgingly but still accepted by, 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 by the other side. Um, on, um, on the last point that Piet said that that could be somehow, well, maybe even unfair that the European Union would have to respond to things that, that it's not to be blamed for. Uh, <clears throat> in this um, investor to state business, there is a new regulation uh, of 2014, which uh, uh, tries to, to divide responsibility in such cases. Is the member state that has to pay, or the union, or both? So, so there you will find quite detailed rules on this. But this is, of course, only limited to investor-to-state dispute settlement. Lucho uh, the Legal Service of the Commission. Um, just wanted to refer to two parts of uh, one of the uh, of the opinion that has been used. Uh, longly by Pete Kaut. So the, the opinion 213 is a passage that is rarely quoted, and I think, in my view, it's a very important one. I refer to um, paragraph 156 that reads uh, clearly the following. Uh, those, those amendments, uh, referring to the amendments to the European Convention on Human Rights that are under uh, negotiation still, are warranted precisely because, unlike any other contracting party, the EU is under international law precluded by its very nature from being considered a state. And then after that paragraph, follow all the other paragraphs, including the one that uh, you referred to, Pete, on the autonomy of the European Union legal order with respect to the national legal orders and the international law. I think that that element is very much relevant in what we are discussing here. And there is a second uh, paragraph of another judgment that is not usually quoted in this, dis in this debate that I wanted to bring to your attention. And it actually predates uh, Van Genten laws because it is the famous very old Meroni case of 1958. In that uh, judgment, uh, let me try to see whether I can quote the right passage. Yeah, it's, it's paragraph 10, 
there the question was about delegation of powers, not exactly what we are discussing here. But the concept underlying is very, in my view, relevant. To delegate a discretionary power to bodies other than those which the treaty has established to effect and supervise the exercise of such power, each within the limits of its own authority, would render less effective the guarantee resulting from the balance of powers established by Article 3 of the then Treaty on Steel and Coal. So from that already 1958, I mean the, the case is actually of 1956, starting 1956, so well before the creation of the European communities, the nature of the peculiarity of the Europe, European communities system and the necessity of keeping the balance of powers within the concepts and the limits established by the treaties was already clear from the starting point, from the very starting point. And I think, again, that this is relevant with what we are discussing here when we speak about investor state uh, uh, courts or arbitrators. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think in the nature of a comment rather than, than, than a question, but um, I, I would not maybe need to clarify that I would not uh, in any way dispute the necessity to ensure that the way in which the European Union acts internationally and commits itself and participates in international dispute settlement should not indeed uh, undermine the, the, the division of, of uh, either, I mean, the roles of the different institutions and particularly the role of the EU Court of Justice as the ultimate uh, authority to interpret e EU law. Um, I think where we may have differences in view is on the assessment of to what extent particular uh, particular forms of participation like accession to the convention uh, actually constitute such a risk or do not constitute such a risk. I, I certainly agree that that it should not be possible for the European Union to, to modify uh, the relations between the institutions and their respective roles uh, and that it should not be possible to delegate essential functions of the Union to another international organization uh, in breach of those principles. Um, I think that's the only comment I have on that. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, Raila Radovic from the University of Luxembourg. Um, I have a question for uh, Professor Eckhart. Um, if EU is supposed to be a global actor, and through these debates of, I mean, b building practice of the court, of the concept of uh, autonomy, is there any notion or at least element within this discussion of to what extent um, they are limiting themselves as a global actor, um, and here I'm uh, particularly referring to the problem of investment treaties, because um, let's assume that at one day we actually have a established jurisdiction of uh, investment arbitration uh, against the EU under the new new mixed agreements. It is very common that in these agreements there is this famous clause. Um, limiting the powers of the tribunal, saying uh, uh, claimant first has to ask the EU who's the respondent, and then only then we can sue the uh, sue the uh, the other party, which basically is the that uh, is the EU wants to determine uh, who will take the responsibility, right? So in this respect. EU is not innovative. States did, did the same for years. They concluded very narrow dispute settlement clauses, and sometimes tribunals said, well, this basically brings our tax to zero, which would be meaningless, and therefore we uh, need to interpret it in a broader sense and so on. So if is there a concern like this as, a, as an element in what is uh, autonomy on the one hand, and on the other hand, my follow-up question is, if no, do you believe that 
uh, such approach of the EU would be tolerable one day by investment tribunals or human rights if actually uh, international courts and uh, tribunals see, well, we do not have an uh, active participant in the international community, basically they're just trying to limit us, us as much as possible, therefore we need to take different approaches. Uh, th thank you. Um, I wouldn't. I, I would need to undertake an empirical study, in fact, of of, uh, of the, the practice of uh, the European Union trying to negotiate these kinds of uh, treaties, including those systems of dispute settlement, to actually see whether it inhibits the European Union in becoming a, a global actor. I, I, I do not at this point think that we have reached that stage, that there is a, a real inhibition, but, but I do share your concern that the, uh, the focus on the autonomy of EU law may in future constrain the European Union in the way in which it uh, it, it, it tries to participate in, in uh, further treating making and international law, law making. I mean, there, there are lots of uh, ifs and whens anyway, because we, we're not sure in the world of today how much uh, good prospects there are anyway for, for these new free trade agreements, including investment agreements with the kind of contestation which they uh, which they elicit. So um, there are certainly also other questions being asked about about these processes. Um, whether this would be tolerable to, to uh, uh, arbitrators uh, again remain, remains to be seen, of course. But there is always a risk of uh, conflicts, uh, uh, conflicting case law. I think this institution is quite aware that these risks exist not only not only in relation to international tribunals but also in relation to domestic courts and, and tribunals. And as far as possible, they should, of course, be avoided by carefully spelling out uh, what the respective uh, roles are and, and trying not to interfere with, with respective juris main jurisdiction of the, of the courts and tribunals concerned. Hello. Oh, sorry, that was somebody else. Sure. Okay. Uh, Fernando Castillo from the Commission Legal Service. Um, Yes, one question to broaden a bit the, the horizon because we've been discussing about uh, adjudicative bodies, but some, some treaties nowadays contain uh, monetary mechanisms or of, of, of a nature which is a bit different uh, in the sense that you have, for example, sort of experts groups that issue reports, recommendations. There are a few in the Council of Europe, a couple of them in the UN. Uh, my question was to what extent the objections which have been raised by the Court of Justice as regards some types of adjudicative system would apply to this situation. We are talking about bodies that may issue recommendations, there is a follow-up mechanism sometimes, peer review. So even if clearly some of these acts are not binding, they do create some pressure to compliance and they do assess some of these reports whether or not a certain party is complying uh, with, with, the, with the rights and the obligations under these respective treaties. My assumption, my general assumption was always that normally the objections of the ECJ were mainly as regard adjudicative bodies in the sense that it is the ECJ would be protecting its own role. However, without being judges, some, that is, yes, some of these bodies, they are not really arbitral tribunals, they are not courts, but they do have some degree of role in ensuring the implementation of the, uh, of the treaty. Um, what would be your views about, uh, about it, to what extent really the case would really apply and, uh, to such bodies, or it doesn't apply at all, because of their nature is, is so different that doesn't really, they don't really create a problem of autonomy or protecting the adjudicative process that would keep appear in other cases. <laughs> Yes, I mean, what, one of the problems which, of course, we face in, in this area of uh, possible uh, uh, the relationship between EU and international law and possible tension is that at the international level we have so many different forms of uh, dispute settlement, quasi-dispute settlement, uh, uh, differences of opinion even on whether a particular system is a fully judicial uh, adjudicative system or not. Uh, remember, for example, the debates about the WTO dispute settlement system and the question to what extent that is adjudicative or not. Um, so I, I, I can see that there's a range of different uh, possible bodies uh, under a particular agreement with, with functions uh, and that there may be borderline cases where the question arises, is this 
uh, is there a function of an adjudicative nature or, nature or some other nature. But I would, I would sort of draw the line there because it does seem to me that the principles which the court has developed apply to adjudicative systems. And if the, uh, the powers which these bodies have are of a different nature, uh, perhaps they also call for some kind of analysis as, as to what their effect might be, but I would not necessarily immediately feel that, that this case law on autonomy would need to be applied there, because then we are not really talking about bodies with proper jurisdiction to, to uh, apply the agreement in an adjudicative way. But um, it's a good question, and I would, you know, would, would need to be explored further, possibly with practical examples. I can see, I can see the question. Well, there are no more questions. I agree we are near to four o'clock, and so we must stop our first session. And, uh, we have just a little coffee break before we begin the second session of this symposium. Thank you very much to the speakers and to you.